born into the extreme poverty that was Chairman Mao's China and randomly chosen at age 11 to change his life. Eventually, he made it to the West and became one of the best male classical dancers of our time. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with dancer and now author, Lee Swin Singh. great dancer be trained or do they have to be born that way? I think you have to have both. You have to have some talent, but I think at the end of the day that might only be accounting for 20 or 30 percent of your success. The rest, the 80 or 70 percent of that is hard work, is have a great work ethic, have determination, and you know, just really work your butt off to really achieve what you want to achieve. Do you think you always had the gift of dance in you, or is it something that you found? Well, I came from a poor, poor peasant background, poverty-stricken. And at any given day, the tree barks in my village were all being eaten. So my parents were never educated. So my entire life never had any arts or cultural. So that dance or ballet came to me as a utter surprise to me or to my family. Did you know it existed? Did you have an understanding that there was culture out there? The only ballet we saw was on a film. It's called The Red D Detachment of Women, which is uh, Madame Mao's cultural models. And it was a propaganda ballet, was served for Mao's political purpose and where they danced with swords and grenades and guns in their hands. And it was wild. And it was, uh, it was you know, really, it was a heavily political-themed ballet. Uh, dance or artistic uh, merit came secondary. Yeah, when you mention poverty-stricken, I don't think everyone grasps how low down that is. Explain a little bit about what your life was like. I was born into a peasant family. I was the sixth of seven sons. My parents did not go to school for a single day, so they couldn't read or write. But I, there were about 30 million people died of starvation in China before a few years before I was born. So there was no running water, there was no heating, uh, and the, at the winter time, my hometown, the temperature could drop down to as low as 20 degrees below zero, and it's freezing. So, and there's uh, only a few hours of electricity each night. So, utterly, life was incredible. Every time when my mother served the meal for the family, for the entire family, we would look at the meal that served, then we would look at our mother with desperate begging, uh, you know, wanting to know if there's any food, because before we even started, just by look at, we knew we were going to go to sleep starving that night, the food that served was not going to be enough to, to eat for all of us. Did you know there was a life outside of all that, though? Did you understand how other people in the world lived at the same time? Well, we knew what the people uh, in, around us uh, uh, lived in the same vi uh, village, uh, what their life was like, which was some, some people were even poorer than us. And uh, one of my playmates, when I was about six or seven, uh, happily played with me one day. The next day, he just died because he had ate something out of total starvation and had a terrible infection. There was no money for his parents to take him to the hospital. So he suddenly died about a week or so later. And, but we were told when we grew up by the Chinese propaganda that we lived in the most glorious, most prosperous life. Lucky, we were very lucky to be born under Mao's um, you know, China. So uh, the, our impression of the Western world was even much poorer. They lived in a much, much poorer life, and the sky was gray, the, you know, the whole, uh, they lived in the dark ages. So we grew up with that impression. Yeah. When you went to school, what was school like? The, my, I still, I mean, you know, my school, uh, I didn't go to school when, until when I was nine because there's no classrooms available. So, uh, and I, uh, this simple coming shop, a shack, no heating, 
that particular winter where I was, uh, when I was selected to go to the Madame Mouse Peking Dance Academy, uh, just as when I was about turning 11. And that day was freezingly cold, snowing very, very hard. My mother had sewn this thick cotton quilted coat and pants. I looked like this round snowball <laughs> reading, I love you, Chairman Mao Tex, in this freezing cold room. Suddenly, four gentlemen walk out into the room, looking dignified the way they dressed, and it was just not the ordinary people in my hometown. Suddenly, they were introduced to us as Madame Mao's cultural advisors from the Beijing Dance Academy to select talents for, to train as ballet dancers. But again, as I said earlier, we didn't know anything about ballet, and we were asked to stand up to sing I Love You Chairman Mao songs. As we sang, these four gentlemen walk along the aisles, look at each person's faces, there are about over 40 of us. They passed me by without taking any notice. They selected one girl out of the 40-odd kids. Just as when they were about to walk out of the room, my teacher hesitated and eventually tapped on the shoulder for the very last gentleman. Just as he was about to walk out the door, she said, excuse me, sir, what about that one? And that one was me. Just years later, when I tracked her down, I said, teacher son, please tell me, why did you single me out that day? For what reason? She said, for years, Lee, I wondered. I still don't really know why I point you out that day. But all I thought at that moment was, you ran fast. <laughs> I ran fast in my sports classes. <laughs> and that was the sole reason she pointed me out. But then suddenly I was put into, uh, you know, sort of led into this room, which is the only room in the school had the had the little heater, which is the head of the school's office. We were torn, uh, they take all our clothes off. They measured us inch by inch of, of our bodies. There were about 10 of us there from all different classes uh, was selected there. And suddenly I was pushed against the wall. One person held one of my knees straight. The other person pushed both my shoulders firmly against the wall. So I could not move a single inch. The third person lifted the other leg high up in the air. As he lifted, he kept on asking me, does it hurt? And it was excruciating. They have torn both of my hamstrings that day. But stubbornly, I knew well, I knew deep inside of me that that was my one and only chance that I have dreamed about to get out of that vicious life. I'm uh, sure you've thought about and wondered what if you hadn't been chosen, what your life would have been. Any idea how it would have gone from looking at your family or other people in the village? Oh, I would have been a peasant working in the field for the rest of my life, just like one of uh, the stories in my father's fables, the little frog was born in a well which he never knew anything other than you know, his little environment, his little patch of sky. That's what he was taught by his father. That's all life had to offer until one day he met this land frog. The land frog told him what was up in the real world. He, from that, that moment onwards, he desperately tried to escape that fate he was born into, which like his father and his forefathers never could escape it. And uh, then one day when my father told me that story, I said to my father, I said, are we living in a well? And his answer was, I certainly would not call our life heaven. And from that moment onwards, I wanted desperately to escape the fate I was born into. And I wanted to do something special with my life. And maybe then I could come back to help my family. So you're 11 years old, just chosen to go to the academy. What happens? Are you taken away from your family? Are they, how, what's the relationship? I was terribly homesick. I, uh, we were not allowed to visit our families um, until the end of the year. So once a year we were allowed. Uh, I was just, I was really sobbing myself to sleep at night, uh, clutching onto my mother's quilt. And I did not want to other people to discover my tears. So I covered myself at night time just it's for quite many times during these first two years. Uh, our training was brutal at the Peking Dance Academy. We got up at 5.30 in the morning, went all the way to 9 o'clock at night, six days a week. And we, the training was utterly brutal. And it was this incredible Russian training, but we were shouted at. And um, it's, it was an incredible life. And, and uh, taught me discipline, taught me determination. Uh, I, 
you know, I, I, once I fell in love with ballet, I strapped sandbags on both of my legs, hopped up and down, up and down on one leg at, at, on four flights of stairs at five o'clock in the morning to train my jumping ability. And I was, would sneak away at night time, light this little candle in the dark studio, endlessly practice my turns so I would not be discovered. I can't turn the light on because then otherwise I would be... It, you know, have to go back to bed again. So I was endlessly trying to, uh, you know, sort of practice my spotting in my turns. I felt if I could turn in the dark light, uh, I could turn with lights on stage. What was it about ballet, though, that spoke to you? Was it the love of the art form, or was it the escape that it promised you? At first, I thought I was lucky to get a bowl of rice for the first time in my life, have enough food to eat when I was at the Peking Dance Academy. And then eventually through this wonderful teacher who was my mentor, who discovered me at the end of my second year at the Beijing Dance Academy. He loved about it with passion and he, one of his mission was he felt I was talented and he wanted to, me to look at ballet through his eyes. And it, that did it for me. And he guided me, he nurtured me, he encouraged me to to really to you know to really to get into the process of loving that ballet. And eventually I loved ballet with passion. I realized how beautiful this art form truly is and the music just uh, maybe it's m music because I was starved of music for the rest of my life. So when I first heard a beautiful piece of music played with this wonderful piano, and I just thought, my God, you know, this was heaven. And yeah. so that, that music combined with the graceful movements of the dance took my heart away. So from that, that moment onward, I worked probably harder than anybody in the, at the Peking Dance Academy. And in the end, from a hopeless dance uh, uh, in a ballet student, became one of the top in China. When they talk about things like this, you often hear people say survivor guilt. Was there any part of you that felt guilty that you were getting this life, that you had your bowl of rice and your family didn't? Was there a part that ever was difficult to deal with? For all these seven years, when I was at the Peking House Academy, every time I had a bowl of rice, every time I had a fruit, I had an apple or banana, I cannot stop myself from thinking, I wished I could give this bowl of rice or half of the bowl of rice or this fruit to my mother. I knew they were still starving back home. Only if I could kept it for them, I would have done it. And it was just, uh, and years later when I came to America, that was the same way. I never took life for granted. I treasured everything, all the beautiful things life had to offer. And I, I really constantly tried to remember what it was like back in China. And I, I could never forget that. So every, when I had the very first opportunity to send money home to my family, to my parents, to my brothers, I did. Yeah. And I'm, I still, I'm still doing that today. There was a point where you came to this country, you got invited here for a school to learn more dance here. How did that come about? Amazing. It's, it's an amazing opportunity, sort of almost by fate, just like the day I was selected to study ballet and the day I was discovered by this teacher in Beijing. And in 1979, I was discovered by Ben Stevenson, who was the artistic director of the uh, Houston Ballet and now the artistic director of the Texas Ballet Theater in Dallas-Fort Worth. And he went to China with the very first cultural delegation from America to China. That was in 1979. And there he taught a couple of master classes. He discovered me, offered two scholarships to come to study at the Houston Ballet Academy summer school that year. Why, let me stop you there and just ask, why did the 